Hello, it's John and I again. Welcome to you all, all over the world. And we're delighted to be back talking again about uh, aspects of Mapperton. Um, this time we're going to be talking about ceilings. We're always delighted uh, to be doing this and we are very grateful for the wonderful feedback that you give us. I read them all from end to end actually and there was only one to which I took objection which said surprising they can remember anything at their age. However, I will pass on that since there are rather major figures in your administration of the same age as me. We're going to do ceilings, they're up there. So if you find us not looking at you quite as much as we normally do, it'll be because we're looking at the ceilings like that. John, like that. <laughs> we're now upstairs in what's called the Great Chamber, which was the principal reception room for the house. So this was built in the 1530s. No, more, 1550s. Sorry, 15. By the way, this afternoon, there are quite likely to be a number of slip-ups on dates. And if there are, I hope you'll excuse them. After all, what is a couple of years among friends? Well, no, you were right about the house was built then, 1540s, and then the ceiling was being done after that. So the ceiling is 1550s. 50s. But this ceiling, which is one of the most magnificent ceilings actually in England, there's a similar one at Hampton Court, and there's a similar extraordinarily beautiful one up in North Yorkshire, at a place called Gilling Castle. And this has the fleur-de-lis in it, which were a symbol of Robert Morgan's coat of arms. There's one wonderful moment I had, because we used to sleep in this room, uh, when I heard a drip, 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 drip coming through to my shock horror. So I then crawled up into the roof to see where the leak was and actually found a, a, a bucket and a bath just in the same place. So obviously this leak had happened before. It's looking wonderful, but it could do with a little bit of restoration in the next 10 years. In fact, definitely. No, we've done that. some restoration. That was done, but that, look at that over there. That's got to be done yeah. sometime. But in a house like this, something needs to be done all the time. And when you think you've got through one thing, the next thing turns up. You do learn a lot, though, from ceilings about the house and the owners of the house. As Caroline mentioned, um, the fleur de lis is very common um, in this room and in the drawing room. And this was Robert Morgan's symbol. Um, it may be that he was a courtier because he had a special dispensation to wear a bonnet in the king's presence. And we all joked that this was because of diverse infirmities in the head. Not in his brain, just in his head. In his yeah? head. And there was a previous Morgan who was allowed the same. So we think they probably were courtiers and the fleur-de-lis remains a, a royal symbol today. It's very beautiful with these pendentives. Um, they are um, of wood and they're hung onto a frame above. So there's a wooden bar coming down through each of the pendentives. So this is the finest ceiling in the house and it's 16th century. And then when we go downstairs, the second finest ceiling, which is also 16th century, is in the room below, which would have been the solar, and was also built by Robert Morgan, and so probably was also 1550s. So it, it'll have another symbol of Robert Morgan. We'll see that. Coats of arms. And his forebears mm -hmm. go back to the 14th century. Yep. My well, heart. we're learning a certain amount from our new book, history book, which is called Mapperton. <laughs> And it's written by a distinguished architectural historian who lives locally. The point about this book is that I think if you're really going to enjoy these little vignettes that we do of Mapperton, you would find this very, very useful. Because when John and I get the dates wrong, you'll be able to correct them by reading the book. And you can get it through the website. Mapperton.com. Mapperton.com. And I recommend it to you. And we also have the story of the murder, which we'll tell you downstairs. Which murder? <laughs> the murder of Mapperton. Not oh, that, that Mapperton, one, but it was oh, yes. the, oh, yeah. the son, murdered by Robert yeah. Morgan's son. There haven't been any other murders, I don't think. OK, shall we go off down? Yep. If you would like to help support this important part of England's heritage, please become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Mapperton Live. When I was sort of walking down from the Great Chamber, um, 
to downstairs where we're going to show you the other 16th century ceiling in the what's called used to be called the solar. But before we do, um, we're in what's called the staircase hall, uh, which was uh, redesigned or well, designed in the 18th century um, when this big staircase was put in and this great big ceiling was put in. And for me, it has a kind of resonance because in the 80s, when I think John was in London and my father-in-law was here. Yes, that's right. Um, my father-in-law by that time was a little bit sort of vague. And he said, no, it's not going to be cold tonight. Uh, and turned the heating off. And it was extremely cold and every, every um, pipe in the house froze. <laughs> And the radiators froze up in the attics, and when it thawed, of course, they all broke. And as a result, there was a radiator just above that satyr's head there. And you can see he's got a very decent long nose, and there was a drip on the end of his nose from the water above. For Which went on for months, ages. <laughs> two months or so, <laughs> drip, drip, drip. Yeah. And John, you were here and you said that the, you heard drips where there weren't drips. Well, that was part of the same problem, exactly. We had pots ever, under every part of the ceiling, all the way down the passage here, almost a symphony of sound. Yep. But it was on, on the edge of a really fine Rococo <laughs> ceiling. And you can see a detail further down, downstairs. But um, we're talking about the Broderip family now, aren't we? Yes. In the 18th century, yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, 17, well, this is 1720. We did a very clever job of carving out the hall, um, saving the, the ceilings on either side, you know, because... Well, they so, yeah, lost those two. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. should we go down to yeah. see that? This is the library, and here we have the best example of the Rococo ceiling. Um, all the work was done by the Bastard Brothers, very well known. We are lucky to have this. Um, it reminds me of some really remarkable woodwork I've seen in houses like Petworth as well. You know, it's, it's a very skillfully created image. What do you think, love? Well, the Bastard Brothers knew that they had a good market and they sure milked it. Uh, because this particular design, I have, which is on a ceiling here, I have seen on a vertical drawing room wall in a house in Dorchester. Uh, so, and I think, in fact, it's plaster work. They were plaster designs rather than car wooden carving. But that doesn't detract from it. It's beautifully done and it's very pretty the way the um, wreaths of flowers twine in and out of the, uh, the straight lines of the ceiling. Very prettily done. And we should say it was done for a, a magistrate who wanted to enlarge That's right. his, build, his yeah. house. Yeah. And uh, he created a new entrance. The thing is that both the Morgans and the Brodreps, the two families that built the house, the Morgans in the 16th century, the Brodreps in the 17th and 18th, you know, they were families who'd come to Dorset and they were showing that they were part of Dorset society. Um, they were... They had wealth, some wealth, and they had position, and they were making their houses appropriate to where they saw themselves in society. And funnily enough, that most of them tried to become members of Parliament. <laughs> failed. But failed. Yeah, some <laughs> but should we go back to the 16th century? Yes. In the other room? Yeah, sure. We're now down in the other 16th century room, um, again, built by Robert Morgan um, and with a 16th century ceiling. But I don't know if this is 1530s or 1550s. You think it's probably 1550s? Well, I'm, I'm fairly sure that the ceilings were 10 or 15 years after okay. the building of the house, yes. Right, so we're saying that this is 1550s. It's interesting because it's got a lot of heraldry in it. It's got three coats of arms. One of them is the rather um, fussy piece of heraldry coat of arms there with a fleur-de-lis in the middle. So that is the coat of arms of Robert And there's another Morgan. one there with three, oh, there are a lot of, no, not three there. crescents. Wait a moment. 
but I haven't finished. That right. is Robert <laughs> Morgan's coat of arms. And then what is interesting is the coat of arms with the three crescent moons in it. For the whole period, about 40 years that John and I have been here, we've never identified that coat of arms. And all sorts of people have suggested it was this and it was that and it was the other. And finally, when Tim Connor was um, writing this history of Mapton, which I'm recommending to you again down here, um, he went to Garter King of Arms, who was a friend of a friend, and Garter King of Arms uh, identified it. And it belonged to the Brit family, and the Brit, B-R-Y-T, as opposed to Brett, and they were the family that took over this house from William de Moyne, who was, as we all know, uh, William the Conqueror's kind of leader in the southwest in the 11th century. And they continued to have this house, the Brit family, until the 14th century, when Maud Brit married a Morgan. And that's how the house went into the Morgan family. And so this is a courteous little reminder of... Eight generations earlier, the liaison between Maud Britt and one of the Morgans. The third shield, which is not a coat of arms actually, it's only a symbol. symbol. That is a Brett, the that red is a, lion. The red lion of the Bretts, yeah. different from the Brits. And that's part of the reason why we never got it all straight, because we couldn't believe we were dealing with Brits and Bretts in one house. And that's also reflected on the roof yep. with the finials. Yes. Yep of the lion, although he's not painted red, he's looking the worse for wear. <laughs> he's all right. Now you'll remember my story about the cold-headed Morgans who had to wear a hat in the king's presence. We also have the hot-headed Morgans in the name in particular of John Morgan, the son of Robert, um, who disagreed with his sister marrying a Protestant who was actually a high sheriff of the county and to, to the extent that they had a very strong argument and he murdered his brother-in-law across a dining table, not at Mapleton. And uh, he, off, he off he went to prison and was duly hanged. So this was a rather heavy tragedy in the stories of Mapleton. But what's interesting about John Morgan's murder John Morgan's killing of his brother-in-law. He killed his sister Anne's husband, and he wrote a letter on the eve of his execution, the night before, both to his mother, saying, Your son dieth not, but sleepeth, till the Lord Jesus revive him. Whoso abuseth his time shall have his time cut off. Um, and then he wrote a very um, moving sentence to his sister Anne, because Anne had been responsible for having him taken to trial. Take counsel of him who loveth thee no more with lateral love, for thou hath quenched it, but with Christian love, which thou canst not quench. First serve God thyself, and bring up thy children in his fear. Written by the dying hand of some time thy brother, now by thee overthrown. And with that, we've got to go and see another ceiling. So, shall we go next door to see what Mrs. Labouchere has done? It's quite comfortable here. Well, I know. But I think we better go next door. Yeah. You won't be getting value for money. Keep on the full move. measure of ceilings. This is a very agreeable little film that we're doing today, sitting on the sofas in the house, <laughs> uh, regarding the ceilings. Well, it's the only way we can see the ceilings. It's the only way we can do That's it. That's an excuse. And we will, of course, get various bits of information wrong, but you can always look in the book. Um, and then you'll get it right. So this ceiling... This is an arts and crafts ceiling, it's called, and it was put in by Mrs. Ethel Labouchere, who was the new owner of the house in 1919, after the end of the Brodrips and the Morgans and the Comptons. So this was new ownership and rebuilding of the manor after the First World War, which was always a cause of neglect in houses. Um, how do you think she did? Do you think she did well? <laughs> well, she certainly turned it into a building site because she redid the, all the roofs. So there's no reference, if you go up into the, into the roof space, there's no reference to the 17th, 16th or 17th century roof um, construction. 
She really did it. And actually, if you're looking at the ceiling, which we are and you will be, um, you can see these two bars, which you might think are oak beams holding up um, the house. I think they're rolled steel joists because they're too small for oak beams. And in any case, in the story that I told you uh, before about put, uh, stopping a leak in the great chamber, as I was crawling along the roof space, I stubbed my knee on a rolled steel joist. And instead of being cross, I was absolutely delighted because it made, made me realise that the house was probably not going to fall down and was properly shored up by good uh, 20th century uh, engineering. So that's what I think those are. These, the various symbols here, well, they're the winged horse. It's going to be Pegasus, I think, isn't it? Who was, which was a kind of well-known symbol. And these sort of bunches of fruit up there, I think they're, I've always been told they're hops, not grapes. They could be grapes, but I think they're hops. But do you think she was trying to make a, a, an Elizabethan ceiling? Do you think there was en enough in common um, with uh, classical ceilings to make her feel that she was continuing a tradition? Yeah, I think so, don't you? Yeah. And next door, in the little tiny ceiling next door, again, she's done a sort of 17th century style ceiling. And she must have had a classical education because of the frieze <coughs> that's below yeah. the ceiling. Yeah. Which comes from the Temple of Apollo, or is a copy of the original in the British Museum. But I, this is a very fine ceiling. We paint it from time to time because the big fire there always smokes, or smokes a bit. And then the ceiling gets grubby, and then it all has to be repainted again. And then we have to be careful to use the right sort of paint for a ceiling of this period. Um, I'm glad you mentioned repainting because there was also my father getting smoked up in the library. He closed the door, smoked himself, and the fire was going full tilt. And that became yellow, completely yellow, that ceiling. And we had to paint it again, yes. didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing is that these houses face east and west, these 17th century houses, 16th, 17th, so you need to keep the ceilings kind of clean and bright because they reflect the light in the room. They're really important. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything else to say about the ceiling, <laughs> actually. But thank you so much for listening for us, to us for this short time. We, we enjoy doing these short films and we will continue to look out for subjects. It yeah. might be of interest to you and don't overlap too much with each other. I know that you'd like, so long as you don't tell me that I'm too old to remember things, um, I will do, try and do one on China. But the one That's on China, idea. I shall have to do some quite serious work on. Because it's one thing to say, oh yes, this is a bit of Meissen. But you've actually got to be able to say, yes, this is a bit of Meissen from the 18th century and this is 19th century. And then we've got a rather fine collection of coffee cups and tass through in the in the cupboard through there and actually they're French and German and I have to learn them I don't remember that sort of thing so that person's right um, so you've given yourself some more work right well, now <laughs> no well it's a pleasure to do it for you all and if I if we think that you're really enjoying this and getting to know this house in a sort of more intimate way then that's a great pleasure for us so, thank you. <laughs> buy the book. I've done that, said that. <laughs> and please buy the book. <laughs> um, buy two copies, give one to your um, cousins. Thank and you I, very and much. And thank you very much indeed. <laughs>